Welcome back to the Night Pitch, my friends. Episode 14, Justin Wick, Evan Johnson. Evan, I've been thinking at length after I rewatched the film Moneyball, the classic. I thought to myself, there's a moment at the end of that movie with Brad Pitt's character, Billy Bean, talking about more importantly than what the 2001 Oakland A's accomplished on the field, it was the fact that they changed the game. It was talking about what's the ulterior motive behind, you know, the justification of changing the game. How much more important is that than potentially anything else in the game? So this led me down a rabbit hole to reconsider a book that I read back in the year 2016, published by Brian Kenny of MLB Network. The title of the book is called Ahead of the Curve. And within this book, he lists the five most important people he considers that changed baseball like the five most influential people in baseball history. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe there was only one player on his list of five, which then got me thinking back to the Moneyball situation of Billy Bean's character saying, changing the game. It made me recognize how so many of these changes and so many of these revolutionary occurrences aren't necessarily happening with the people that are in uniform. And it kind of took me a moment to really comprehend this as far as the people that are making the most lasting impact in the game, what are they doing? What is their job title? And what is the long-term effect and recognition? So I want to present this to you of, does this sound ignorant at all? Like, cause I don't necessarily want to be right on this because I understand people come to see the players. They come to just be there to watch the game. And that's what people want to do is play it. Is this, potentially rational or is there any way to kind of reframe this to show how players can change the game too no i think it is i think players sometimes they change the game right you have a couple instances but i feel like most of the time the game changes and the players adapt you know because you have to keep that job you have to keep playing if there's a if there's a boss that tells you we want you to play it this way then you know You start playing it that way. Yeah. But if you're really, really good, like, for example, like a Bob Gibson, where they had to change the mound. The mound. Yeah. That's right. In order to, (laughs) because they, you know, for whatever reason, Bob Gibson's throwing flames, you know, for 30 win season or whatever they did at that point in time. (laughs) It was, it's, it's kind (laughs) of like if you're good enough, right, as a player, like a, legendary player like a Babe Ruth or like a Bob Gibson or like even maybe like a Shohei then you know you can change the game but a lot of times it's I feel like the game changes from an organizational standpoint right and just recently it's changed a lot there's a different philosophy about baseball than there was even in like the 80s even if Babe Ruth had ushered in like a I guess like a power hitting sort of thing yeah it still didn't really like seeing how he could sure yeah and then it kind of came full force with the steroid era and then now modern baseball is strike people out and hit home runs you know yeah well that's really interesting too because i think that in the modern game of you know seeing that we are pushing the limits of maybe what the human body can accomplish. And I think a reflection of this is seeing this. I'm not trying to take this too far out of context, but if you recognize the spike in Tommy John surgeries and the amount of time that starting pitchers spend on the injured list to see that maybe we're almost reaching the limits of human capability before the body. I mean, ACL tears in the NFL of a similar type of discussion of we found ways to maximize performance and push the limits of what humans are capable of. And the closer you get to those limits, the more breakdowns you're going to see and naturally the more injuries that you're going to see. Now, recovery also improves and new tactics also improve and develop. So it's not that we're just like in this dark hole of injuries are just only going to keep getting worse, I guess. But like, I think as far as where I'm going with this is just speaking in terms of the changes that happen within the game itself. I think of... If there's a trainer that has tra- like cracked the code and knows how to develop players, knows how to bring the best out of them, the influence and the long-term impact of that person encouraging and developing so many different players as opposed to just one isolated player, I think that when you talk about impact and long-term growing the game, it's amazing to really recognize how there could be somebody that's never had any playing experience in their entire life, but just because they know 
the inner workings of how to develop players and maybe not even just within a limited scope it could be a general kind of concept but that was something that kind of took me a minute to really comprehend and i think it's the as you were saying i think it's the players that were put in different situations that were not typical um i mean if you want to say babe ruth revolutionizing power hitting if you want to say of course what shohei is doing playing both sides of the ball other ones that stand out to me was Andrew Miller in 2016, a relief pitcher. Um, this was mainly when he was with Cleveland. Terry Francona, as the manager, would use him not as a closer, but kind of like a fireman of at the first sign of needing to put out the fire. The most viable reliever in the Cleveland bullpen for that run was Andrew Miller, but he wasn't being used in conventional save situations. So... That got me thinking, all right, was Andrew Miller the one that did the impact? Is he the one making this influence? Or was Terry Francona the one that was making the impact? I don't know. I think so. That was the thing. It's so vague. I know. Well, I think, Terry, I mean, managers, they all do it differently. You have like old school managers, you have like kind of new school managers. But like, think about the concept of the opener. Like, that's a new thing, you know? If, if you tried to do that in 1930, people would be like, you're crazy. We're going to have one guy throw the first <laughs> inning and then we're going to take him out. <laughs> like, But, I mean, baseball is changing like that. Like you said, they've got guys that, you know, play at the peak of their ability for a very short period of time. Not in terms of career length, but in terms of, like, length of the game, right? Like, to bring up Bob Gibson again, he throws, you know, complete games most of the time that he would go out there and throw or pretty close now it's like a, yeah. a quality start is you get half the more than half the game done and you know a yeah. lot of times it's less because you're planning to play the matchup or let's run you know four bullpen arms out there and have them just try to blow smoke for an inning and call it good <laughs> you know and I yeah. mean, it also comes with the league too, because you had rule changes as well with the uh, with the amount of hitters that pitchers could throw to. So it's, I feel like baseball changes a lot constantly in terms of strategy, and you wouldn't know this, yeah. if, you know, if you weren't like an avid fan, like most people who are listening to this show are. But like, <laughs> like you said, it's not often. I don't think it's the players as often as it is organizational in the league standards and like game strategy yeah, it, because they're just forced to adapt that's true and i think that's kind of interesting to really reshape the context because i think it's the players that are the avenues to display something working but it's up to somebody else oftentimes to really allow those ideas to come into fruition so i'm thinking in terms of i understand shohei otani might be kind of the anomaly at this point but when he came stateside Let's just hypothesize if there was only one team that was willing to allow him to be a two-way player. Well, yes, it's Shohei that's showing this level of impact and like showing that this is truly possible. But it's ultimately going to come down to some executive that gives the check mark to allow them to do what ultimately he is capable of doing. I think of, you know, I think it's easy to say Jackie Robinson is one influential people in the game of baseball and i don't think anybody would argue with that but i also think i shouldn't say but i sh- and i also believe it was branch ricky who gave that seal of allowing it to happen to where you know i'm not going to try to say comparing who had the bigger impact branch ricky or jackie robinson they're all in their own rights very impactful and for good reason but it's amazing to see that sometimes that impact isn't mutually exclusive to one person. I thought that list in Brian Kenny's book, it made me think about, you know, who would I consider the five most influential, which I don't like ranking people in this list because everybody should be very good in their own right. But a name that really stood out to me was Frank Job. And for people that maybe don't know that name, it's because instead of naming it Frank Job surgery, it is called Tommy John surgery. <laughs> Frank Job was the surgeon that performed Tommy John surgery. So it was, it ultimately required Tommy John to be the one that fulfilled the rehab that had the courage to have an experimental surgery performed on him. Of course, now it's far from experimental, thanks to those guys. But, you know, I think in terms of the impact on the game, and this is something that I think is really reinvigorating and something very inspiring. And I think it just really shows something cool about the human experience is that very seldom will you see somebody make an impact 
that is just based on themselves alone. Very often it requires at least a second person that allows it to happen and encourages it to happen too. So, I mean, I this is going to be kind of corny. I knew our show wasn't going to take off without somebody in that exact same light. But I think of, you know, if you want to view this in a collective kind of leadership sense or just, you know, making the most out of the human experience that we have, I think that really shows the capabilities that go along with it. And I think that was the most important kind of reality. As I go back to the scene in Moneyball, it's Jonah Hill and Brad Pitt, their characters, just hanging out, talking after the season's over and realizing that it was going to take both of them to fulfill this. It took Peter Brand is the character's name in the movie. It took Peter Brand and, um, goodness, I keep trying to say Brad Pitt instead of Billy Bean. I almost stumbled over that. <laughs> it, took the, it took the two of them to mesh together. To so obviously Brad Pitt made an impact on you in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! I just for some reason the name Billy Bean was just I heard the B at the beginning of Brad and it just right, just right. Me off. No, I just thought that was really it, it was really cool to see this, and I think that's part of you know the encouragement of growing the game and recognizing that it doesn't need to just be exclusive to players because there are a lot of people that can really bring good out of the game. I know that we talked about you know the supporting characters as well, but. You know, recognizing that there are multiple ways to perfect your craft within this sport specifically. And I think the storytelling side of baseball in particular really brings the best out of people in that kind of sense. So I don't I mean, I think of those kind of obscure type of realities of this is what we're really working with. But I think the cool part about this is realizing that nobody can do it on their own. Like it requires I think this paints a broad, more broad picture of realizing that it's a lot of people that go into growing the game for the better and you know that's that again that's why we got a second counterpart on the show man and i mean now that i think about <laughs> that maybe that's just speaking into existence how cool it is to have a second person along for the ride right here man <laughs> well you said uh one thing that i that i think kind of hits a hits a nail on a head here which is you can't make an impact if it's just you you know like in order to make an impact, you have to make an impact on people, not yeah, just I, and that. That's what makes an impact on the game. So if you're somebody who thinks differently about the game and has the position to be able to orchestrate things differently, then you create an impact. Like Billy Bean had the position to orchestrate his team differently. And then he had supporting cast in his real life, not in the movie, but supporting cast in his real life of you know, the people who worked with him and also he kind of created theater of like people who disagreed and then that's what created the awareness and then ultimately their results did as well. But like you, it's really yeah. hard. You can't just well, do it by yourself. You can't. That's why it takes, that's why it's, I think the nature of it is organizations and leagues and also fans. Don't forget about the fans yeah, that's too. That's true. Because what fans want fans usually get because they are they control the organization <laughs> like you know what i yeah, mean that, so, you know, that's amazing i actually really like that kind of idea of talking about i mean i i remember i was in a high school classroom and somebody was talking about who are the most influential people like or figures in your life and i remember somebody in my class said the media and I remember getting so pissed off at that, going, really? Like, no, it's, it's it's one of your parents, it's a grandparent, it's an advisor, and then they put the media. And I was like, thinking, that's just so, like... And then I thought about it. And I was like, if it doesn't hit with the media, it doesn't become popular, it doesn't gain momentum, it doesn't, <laughs> yeah. like... It have, I mean, I, w I went from just kind of being pissed about the situation for limited context to, like, it's actually kind of brilliant that they put this yeah. down. So, I mean, I like what you kind of mentioned about fans and the ability to grow something. And, you know, I think in order for somebody to make an impact that is across the entire sport, I mean, it's not to say that it's always going to be liked or appreciated or if everything's going to be perfect. But I think that, you know, in order for something to change the game, it needs to be recognizable for everybody. And I'm not necessarily speaking in terms of you need to curate your impact to cater to the masses because 
I mean, long story short, if the Oakland A's fired Billy Bean in the middle of a losing streak at the beginning of 2001, we may never have really seen that for a lasting while, at least in the context of what existed there. But, you know, I think of the persistence and the qualities that come into this, and especially I think this relates directly to players that are maybe in a dark time of their career or they're not exactly getting where they need. I think it's a constant reminder that the value of having a support system and the qualities of persistence that really go into bringing the good out of the game, bringing the good out of what you believe in and what you're looking to accomplish. And I mean, it's amazing to see where impact can come from out of just unforeseen situations sometimes. So this is, it's cool. I think it's inspiring. I think it's something that I'm pleased that we shaped this discussion this way because I was really worried about prefacing it to sound as though players are incapable of making the impact. But I think the cool part about this too, and I can only like speculate what the conversations were between Terry Francona and Andrew Miller, like we mentioned, of, Andrew, we're looking to do this with you. This is how we want to use you. This is how we believe you're going to be best fit to help us lead to wins. Are you willing to do this? Yeah, let's do this thing. Absolutely. I just think the way that those messages are presented, and I think that's the really cool thing, is when somebody comes to you as a player and they say, I have a plan for you, and this is going to help you the most, you realize that maybe it's not your direct impact that was the creator of the idea behind it, but you're the one that's able to fulfill it and reap the benefits of somebody believing in you. So that's Frank Job performing surgery on Tommy John. That's Andrew Miller with Terry Francona. That's the Angels and Shohei Otani, or maybe that predates it back when Otani was in Japan as well. But, you know, those are the cool moments. And, I mean, I know you could probably attest to this more than me because you've, of course, played longer. But I think that there's not many better feelings in this game than somebody as an executive or as a coach or at, like, a higher position within a team or an organization coming to you and saying, this is what we have planned for you. I think that's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah. It's kind of like you got a job. Andrew Miller had the job to do that. They said, we feel like you could do this best. So that's going to be in his. <laughs> and he just had to adapt, you know. I just, I just, I think that a lot of, and I want to go back to the fans real quick because I feel like now that I'm thinking about it in our conversation, it's like, Every, all of the traditions in the game of baseball come from the fans. Yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not, because, <laughs> and I'm not just talking about like stuff off the field or like stuff that happens in the crowd, but also the way that people play. Because you want, they want to see a win. You have to play to win, and if there's a certain yeah. way where you need to use Andrew Miller to win games to play against who was it, the Cubs? In the World Series? Uh, in the World Series, yeah, that's right. It's the Cubs? Yeah. That's how you needed to use him because the organizations needed to have an excited fan base. They can make money and get better and win more games and the fans get more excited, etc. But then also on the other side of that World Series, you got the Cubs. And the Cubs were... <laughs> yeah. The Cubs. The Cubs. <laughs> Find out in a hurry that this is a little bit. There's some going on right here. There's a lot of people who are Chicago fans that were, you know, losing their mind that that fall. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, this is an interesting point, and I think even further is you know analyzing how money is such a motivator and the financial aspects of the game itself. I think we saw this pretty much very well when the lockout was going on and that's in large part because there wasn't really any other baseball to talk about during the lockout a couple years ago but you know when you recognize that player deals sometimes maybe you're trying to boost some attendance maybe you don't have a star you need to go get them and it's maybe not a like player team development lead us to wins move maybe it's all right it's going to get us a couple extra wins but it's going to give people reason to come to the ballpark to see this guy i think of you know it's it's I understand this is a standard business type of comment and maybe this isn't a deep analysis, but you know, you mentioned how the fans are ultimately the ones that lead the charge. Well, you need to find a way for fans to feel good about spending their money to grow the game of baseball. And I think this is, I mean, I don't want to sound hypercritical with this, but the Tampa Bay Rays stand out to me of you make it to the world series and then you trade away a Cy Young winner 
and then they keep going back. I mean, again, this is a maybe an unfair example necessarily, but I think to myself of more often than not, when you see things stick in the game, it's because it leads a franchise to have more money. And it's a capacity of, you know, if it worked, if it pushed us to the postseason, how can we continue to boost this revenue stream? So the most impactful people in the game, more often than not, it's the people that know how to potentially grow it but how much is growing the game financially based, which I don't like saying because I don't really want to monetize baseball, even though I know that it's very heavily monetized. But I don't know. I like to try to separate the financial specifics with the actual genuine nature of growing the game. And that's why I like to use Frank Job, the surgeon or the doctor, as an example of somebody that grew the game um, that also has a big financial component as well because it saved a lot of players careers and it made a millions of dollars i guess i mean it's always going to be there i mean the the money's always going to be yeah. there but you know there's still kids playing wiffle ball in the backyard imitating ichiro yeah and being really big fans of <laughs> who's the one that you imitated teams. were you a gary sheffield guy <laughs> oh man i think my favorite to imitate when i was a kid would be like albert Pujols. I think, but but yeah. Ichiro for sure. Every little kid, if you're a righty, you always say like, "I'm gonna just grab it left-handed, do like a little can <laughs> running hit or whatever." <laughs> you know, I'm but, glad that you put this in here because I mean, talking about growing the game and making an impact of who's the batting stances that you're doing in the backyard. And I like to. I'm glad that we humanized this discussion too. I mean, not that the other examples that we said weren't human, but. You know, speaking of growing the game and ultimately being the ambassador for the growth of the game of baseball, I think that players, of course, are the ones that have the personalities that are able to present those cards on the table. So I'm pleased that was added in there. And that's one thing that, you know, when I opened up saying this of it's often the non-players that are the ones that change the game the most. Well, it is also the players that are the ones that encourage the game the most. Correct. So I think that maybe it's not a mutually exclusive way to separate the two. Because ultimately it takes collaborative fulfillment, like we mentioned. But I think it's very important to know that it's the players that fulfill the enthusiasm and fulfill the changes, fulfill gratifying people. And, you know, that's where I feel good about humanizing the game as well. So yeah, I'm glad that we put that in there. Well, I wasn't they... going to feel comfortable ending this conversation. <laughs> until we got there. Well, it's like you said, they give the game personality, right? If it was just a bunch of, you know, people making chess moves. I don't feel like anybody would watch it. <laughs> Nobody would be excited. But when you got it's like the World Series of poker, you're just, yeah, you're going. But when you got it. Juan Soto in the World Series as a teenager, and he starts doing the Soto Shuffle, and he's hitting bombs, <laughs> and now kids are doing it in the backyard like that. That's what brings that. You know, I guess maybe like the the childhood excitement or the spirit to the game. Yeah, that's that's what. Cole- it's the ambition. Yes, correct. That's what cultivates the enthusiasm. And I, th- yeah, I think that I that's there. I think that's just imp- just as important as baseball and winning strategy, and the doctors who, you know, revolutionize elbow surgery, UCL surgery, or yeah. you know, Bob Gibson, right? And then to change the rules. But there's players with personalities yeah. that just are so unique and i want to i want to bring up too because in a world where baseball is going this way you have one player that's going this way and i i pretty sure i remember his last name marlins come on wick he hits for he's a contact here hits for a really good average say is it luis arise yes 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 Yeah, I saw him, and I I was scrolling through my phone, and I saw a video of him and his hitting his like hitting routine and his practice routine, and it looks nothing like a lot of what people are doing (laughs) right now. The Marlins put it on their social feeds. Yeah, he's training in Miami right now. Yeah, and I'm sitting here thinking like, ooh, like finally baseball has been going this way for so long, and they have one guy that's just like kind of just taking a this turn <laughs> and i just i am interested to see how many kids just like kind of buy yeah. into like that kind of strategy and we <laughs> might see some different players you know we might see some guys like going for like all right i'm gonna have 
I'm gonna be able to get face hits, and doubles, and steal, and bunt, yeah. like do all this stuff. Because <laughs> as much as that's old school baseball, it could <laughs> baseball changes all the time. You could have a mix. I mean, that was yeah, that was you and I in the backyard talking about Ichiro. I mean, that's the exact same thing. And that's a cool point, and I think this is a cool, encouraging point of. If you're comfortable to be yourself, I mean, this is another good point of the most impactful people are going to be the ones that execute them the best in whatever capacity it is. It's how can you find a way to do you and how can you find a way to do that to encourage others to develop yourself and to be the best version of who you ultimately are? Um, that's not to say that you're the, I mean, if you're kind of a run of the mill power pitcher, be that person. Like, I understand not everybody can be the exception to the norm, of course, but. You know, I think of the stories that stand out and in order to make yourself best equipped to change the game for the better, the genuine degrees of that, whether it be through your personality or through your training, I think that's a very important thing to really highlight. And at the same time, when you get groups of minds together that are willing to do that, that's really freaking cool. Like that's damn cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Well, we well, got a group of minds tuning into the show. So if you made it this far, welcome to the club. Here we go. Love that. I just want to say, here it is. if there's any kids listening, for future reference, there's a lot of different kinds of players out there. What makes you unique is what's is what makes you special, and that's what's going to get you the opportunity that you want. It's not by imitating somebody else. Just That's like money. Tim Lincecum, just like Bob Gibson, <laughs> just like the Rogers twins, all those guys. Yeah, That's a really good point of, I mean, the amount of time I spent watching video of, I'll, I'll be honest, I did throw with slight resemblance to Chris Sale, and he was like poster child of do you. Like nobody can get <laughs> into the body positions that he can. But that's a good point of, you know, do you the best, like find a way to execute that and recognize that, I mean, my body couldn't get into positions that Chris Sale could. I mean, I, it just can't. Like, there's no way. And it's not going to operate the way as other. I wish you could. It'd be really freaking cool if you could. But like, you know, I think that's a good nugget to put together. And I think that's a level of encouragement of, you know, finding a way to be comfortable in your own skin, finding a way to be confident in your own skin and recognizing that. You're equipped with the tools to make an impact no matter what, no matter how big or small that is. And whether that be, you know, excellence on a field or excellence in a managerial capacity or excellence serving others. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can put this together. And the last bit that I want to add is there's a lot of different ways for you to change the game. And not any one of them is mutually exclusive. And there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that no matter who you are. So that's something that... You know, especially for the young crew out there, no matter what it may be, you know, have a good diversified skill set. And as you progress through your life, you're going to recognize that, you know what, maybe I do this really well and this is where I want to make my change. So pretty awesome, if you ask me, man. Pretty darn cool. You said it great. Let's go to break. (laughs) Love that, my friends. That's perfect. We're going to take a short break. Thank you guys for tuning in. You are watching Night Pitch. Skill Interactive Earned Run Average, with the very cool abbreviation Sierra. This statistic answers the question how well a pitcher actually pitched given the factors that are within their control. Those factors include strikeouts, walks, and how they induce contact. This means that Sierra is different from FIP or XFIP largely because Sierra includes ground balls and pop-ups. If a pitcher forces a ground ball, they get credit with Sierra. It doesn't matter if it's fielded cleanly or let's say it squeaks past an infielder. The pitcher got their ground ball. Sierra is essentially ERA, but without the external variance. So it doesn't matter if Ozzy Smith is playing in the infield or if nobody is there at all. Batting average on balls in play shows a very weak correlation year after year. This is why FIP doesn't use balls in play at all, but let's say there's a lot of ground balls. It does show up in Sierra. So in this example, Sierra might provide better context. In conclusion, this number is very good at getting rid of outside noise. So if you are looking to predict future pitcher success, this is a very good place to start.
Welcome back to episode 14 of The Night Pitch. We took a very contextual, very informative-based first half, and we're here to relax in the second half. We're here to talk about hats. And this was all stemmed because at the beginning of the episode, I said to Evan, that's a nice hat you got there. And I learned all about the Seattle Steelheads. Nice little lid that Evan's rocking right there. We got the cream, we got the black accents. That's a good looking hat. So this is something, we always have these discussions at the beginning of the episode of, sometimes I want to put like a collar on and be a little bit more formal as the host. Sometimes I'll avoid the hat. And then we realize this is a baseball show. What hat are we going to wear? How are we going to portray this? And Mm -hmm. we just decided, you know what? We haven't actually talked about hats on the show. We talk about this every single episode before we get started, but we've never dedicated a section to talking about (laughs) this. So Evan, you talked about like the fit of a hat itself and... I know you explained this before the show, but walk us through. You talked about how you like direct the bill, how you like to bend it. Maybe if you want to add in how different guys like to do it. How do you get them to fit the way you like them to fit? Well, I just want to say before we started that we could do multiple episodes on hats. <laughs> and just baseball design in general, because I love it. The, the old school, when teams have that old school look like a... Uh, St. Louis, they started doing on Saturdays for Saturday, I think it was Saturday oh, day the- games. They started wearing cream white with a different logo on the front. And cream white to me screams baseball. It's not really another yeah. sport that wears cream white other than baseball. It's just that old school look. But as far as my hats go and fit, I guess I really like to bend the inner part of the bill more at a curve and keep the front part more flat. I like because it just fits my head better and you don't get this like this kind of look like a Charlie. Morton you don't get kind the of A-frame thing. house. Yes. <laughs> oh. And I know that you <laughs> you Justin, you like to keep them relatively flat. You're in this. You're in this range. Yeah, I'm. I'm a. I'm a pretty flat kind of guy. I'll go with my current employer. How about this? And I did this in large part just. I mean, this was a comfort type of thing. Of, I think this honestly was a product of the era that I grew up in. Of, I don't know when this happened in like the mid, two thousands ish. Al um, Ray. I mean, it was around the same time. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it was around the same time that people were, t- like, pulling their bottom loops of the, like, the ankles of their pants over their spikes, which I don't encourage. Don't do that. That should have never happened <laughs> to begin with. I never did that myself. But, <laughs> like, I remember seeing, I think it was, like, closers of the era. Like, I remember when I was young, I wanted to be a closer. I thought it was the coolest job ever. I still think it is the coolest job ever. That's also why I have an Oakland A's hat is because I'm a huge Grant Balfour fan. There you go. Represent. <laughs> forgot these are two american league teams i don't know if i'm allowed to show this because i technically work for a club right now uh, that's why we put the orioles hat on to begin with anyways i think about i like the fit of this and i know that this isn't maybe the more popular thing people generally call me out for being a weird left-hander for wearing a flat brimmed hat um teammate of mine jack cushing started calling me flat bill And I kind of wish that stuck, but, you know, it is what it is. But I remember different hats that I got during my playing career. It was very hard to make them flat. Like, this one's about as flat as I could get it. But it was just a comfort thing of, like, when I was checking runners, I felt weird because I was thinking about, like, the bill of the hat. And when I was young and I got, like, a new 5950, I didn't want to, like, mess up with the structure of it. I think it was my own paranoia compared like combined with the era of really premier closers in the mid 2000s that just made it stick with me that i don't like a lot of bit i like a little bit but i don't like a ton like just enough of like a five to ten degree but i think the way that you do it too i think the fact that you hybridized pretty much everything and you made a way to make it look good <laughs> like i respect your strategy, honestly. there's a thing that i do with a lot of hat i have all my hats here Let's, let's grab a random one. Let's say this one. A lot of people don't know what this is. But no, West you, Virginia Power. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the the, uh, the home hat. But a lot of times, <laughs> if you have like a gap right here, where you have <laughs> no, your, it like by your temple, what you can do <laughs> is you can take the very end. This is not a good example because it's the same color bill as it is hat. We'll do another one of the same team. 
and we'll go <laughs> this will be the Sunday and we'll go right here and we'll take the very edge of this bill and we'll bend it down bend it down really yeah. hard so then at the very corners of the bill you have like a downturn where that ends up covering and takes away the gap of your temple but if you do it kind of yeah. like the bend the back flat in the front like wick said earlier and i think he nailed it on the top of the head it's a really college look like you've seen every college coach <laughs> with like this kind of look <laughs> you know but i mean it's it's it funny to see well. how distinct that is <laughs> it is i like it I mean, I think it's fascinating. I mean, the other side of this, as far as I've seen people with strategies of they'll take like a squirt bottle with some water and then they'll soak the hat and they'll wear it for like an hour. So it kind of forms to their head and that is a good fit for them. I think it's amazing, too, to see the variance in fitted hats. Like my hat size, it depends on how long my hair is, which I kind of I sound like a diva admitting that, first of all, <laughs> but... I mean, I typically wear a seven and a half to a seven and five eighths, depending how long my hair is. So anyways, I this is one of my favorite ones that I have, and it fits perfectly fine when I'm sorry, I, I wasn't going to correct myself. This is a fitted hat. And well, hold on a minute before you before you get hat. before you get too far. Can you explain what that is on that hat? Because I'm curious. Yeah. Well, this is good because I actually, the, the hat I'm talking about is in my closet still. That's the one of the 20 that I didn't grab. Um, no, this is a good, I think this is a good story point too. I, um, my cousin, Aaron Wick, shout out, much love. Um, also the reason I wanted to play ball, kind of. He went to a lot of big league venues and like when he graduated high school, his family took a trip to like six ballparks. They lived in Michigan and they did an East Coast string by car. And every park that he went to, he got a hat. Which I thought, that's pretty cool. You look back, you know what, we went to the Phillies ballpark, I got a Phillies hat, that's what he did. So, I kind of loosely followed it, but me growing up in Denver, the closest is Kansas City and Phoenix. Like, that, you're kind of in an island in the mountain time zone, and it's not easy to get to parks, but like, I had a Dodgers hat, I had a Diamondbacks hat. It made me remind, it was a good reminder of, you know, that's growing the game and like the cathedrals that it's played in. And so... I got this hat in 2021, 2021, August 2021. I went to AT&T Park. My girl was working at Driveline for the summer, and we drove from Seattle to San Francisco to Reno in one day. And our stop in San Francisco, we went to a Giants game. This was probably one of the dumbest things I've ever done because we woke up at 4 a.m. and we got back to Reno at like 3 a.m. the next day. But we took turns sleeping in the car and we went to a Giants game. It was awesome. So I was thinking to myself, it'd be cool to get like a Giants hat to remember this. But at the time, I was working for the Cubs, so I didn't really feel comfortable buying like an SF. I, I love the Giants hats, but I just... I kind of felt like a conflict of interest type of thing that, you know, I, I'll be honest, I don't really wear anything other than Orioles hats right now because it's just weird when you work for them and you're wearing a different one. But I remember I walked by the baseballism store outside of Oracle Park. I, yeah, I'm sorry. It used to be AT&T. Now it's Oracle. And I saw this and I didn't get it on the way in. So this is the bear on the California flag. So it's got the Aww. bear and the star, but the bear is a pitcher. So it's designed to represent the state of California, but it's in Giants colors. So I was kind of, I mean, I, I thought it was as fitting as it was. And I walked by and I was like, oh, I can't really, it's still a Giants hat. And I'm like, no, it's not a Giants hat. It's representing the trip that you guys spent here. And that's pretty was, cool. They only had it in a snapback. This is the only snapback hat that I think I have. But so it was like, I can't. Kind of what we were talking about before, before I had asked uh, Justin that question is new era hats they're all handmade so they all fit different and yeah he doesn't sound like a diva because i had to change my hat size because i didn't always have long hair but i grew it out but then i had to change hat size so a lot of the hats that i do have they don't fit me because i i have to get a higher size yeah. because my hair gets longer but sometimes it depends on what hats you get because they're handmade so you, you have to like 
kind of figure it out. You just and it's kind yeah, of a yeah. thing when you go to a new affiliate, you go in there and you try on a bunch of hats and you're like, yeah, okay, this one fits. Yeah. All right, we're good to go. You know, that's a really good point you add to. I hate ordering hats online because I I mean, I have multiple seven and a half hats that some fit perfect, some are extremely tight. Like the variance that exists of I mean, a handmade hat, that's the way it is. It just works that way when it's hand stitched. I mean, we talked about baseballs before being hand stitched of not every ball feels the same but it's amazing to see how baseball people just have this level of recognition for holding things or wearing things <laughs> like i mean i understand this probably goes across the board but i think that's the fun level of it um i also have an admission i have this hat in two sizes this is Arizona Fall League team at a ballpark i worked at what team is um, it i literally have this this is the Mesa Solar Sox um one of the more noisy logos i mean i this one's grown on me um it kind of works well on a hat to be honest yeah i mean i remember seeing it thinking to myself this is this isn't i mean this is one of my favorites honestly i got some sentiment for that ballpark in the fall league um you know this is a good discussion too of there's a lot of noise on this one and there's not a lot of noise on this one of the thing that I like about a good like hat is if you're looking across the field, you can recognize this of like if you're looking behind home at the right fielder, you know that this is the Oakland A's as opposed to you don't really know. I'll try to use this as an example like this is the former employer again. This is a great hat. This is a Cubs hat. This is what they wore at the Field of Dreams in 2022. I love this and I like how simple it is and I get that this isn't meant to be like a routine hat like this one type of thing. But if you're looking at this across the field as opposed to you're looking at this across the field, I think that's really cool as far as yeah, this is this is it. This is you know what it is when you look across the diamond. Um I don't really think that applies to minor league hats though, because minor league hats are fun. A lot of them are fun. And I know you have plenty of those, too. I don't want to be stealing the shine right here. A lot of them are pretty fun. I have a... Oh, man. Okay, here you go. This is an interesting one. It is the Everett Aqua Sox. Um, <laughs> yes. The <laughs> But the 4th of July hat or the Memorial Day hat. Um, EVE. Oh, that's right. The short for USA, and then inside the numbers there is a flag. I have another version of this that's all camo, and then the logo is gold, and all the all the oh, other is stuff the is gold. One? Yes, I have that. I wear that actually to go throw every day because it's the one that fits me. Because this one doesn't fit yeah. me anymore because this was before oh, I grew my hair out. So this one's retired. And a lot of the other ones are retired as well. Um, another funky minor league hat. The Modesto Nuts. I like that one. Yeah. That's a sharp. That, that's yeah. a classic too. That one goes back a little while. Yes. It's just a it's just a nut with a hat on. It's really all it is. <laughs> but there's a lot of fun minor league hats. And if you aren't familiar uh what can you say the name of the actual promo that these are from? Um, well, I believe it's Copa de la Diversión. See, I may have butchered that too. It's the the Copa hats are what I've been told. I mean, there's like a there's an alter identity that a lot of minor league teams have used, and it's very Latin influenced. Like there's the San Antonio Flying Chanclas as opposed to the San Antonio Missions. <laughs> it's, it's like you kind of use a counter identity for like a day once a week, every once in a while. So those are those are the Copa hats for Everett. I, I love the blue one. Well, this is this is for Everett, and this is Conquistadores, and then this is uh, Tacoma. I thought this one was pretty interesting. Oh, it has okay. that traditional uh, that baseball look of the all white. Uh, front yeah, there the white the front. firm yeah, back I, that, there you go. that is a good baseball look also it's cream white big baseball color there you go look at you representing right there man <laughs> you know i think that's fun and i mean i think this is an interesting quality too evan i know this is a team that you i mean you and i played with this is a northwood summer team the mm -hmm. st cloud rocks hat has a lot of noise on it 
which this doesn't necessarily make it bad. I mean, I think these are cool, and I mean, if you see this from up close, you realize this is very distinct, very unique, very identifiable for... You know, it's easy for a big league team, again, to have identifiable hats. If everybody recognizes this for it being very clean, and I really do, I'm a sucker for a good, clean, big league hat. But I think of, like, the amateur ranks or the minor league when you have a lot of noise. But this one, probably my favorite that I wore as a player was the throwback that we had of, I absolutely loved these hats. These are modeled, modeled after the 1950s minor league St. Cloud Rocks. Um, favorite hat that I wore as a player was this one. Uh, I wear this one a bunch too still. But I think that's cool. I mean, I just, I like a simple, good looking hat. I know that a couple years ago, the Rockies, when they hosted the All-Star game, me growing up in Denver, we were getting hat. I went to the All-Star game because I couldn't miss it growing up in Colorado. And then we all got hats, my brother, my dad, and I. I got the one that the team wore with very simple on the side. Whereas the two of them got like the very like loud, obnoxious all-star hats that they wore like in blue and red and they had like mountains and patterns and all over. I'm like, no, I'm a classic pure kind of dude. I haven't worn this in a while. Oh, that one fits even better than I thought. There you go. Um, but also the tough part about it is I feel like I need to keep this on ice for like another 10 or 15 years because this will look really cool as like a vintage type of thing as opposed to wearing 2021 in 2024 just looks like you're not willing to turn the page yet. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's no, that's a cool, lot of though. I mean you go minor leagues, I think the the thing is to find something trendy that is different. And I mean even even in like the Northwoods League, right? Like my my brother play played for the Pit Spitters and they would do a night every year where they were the cork dorks. Because it's big oh, wine country great. up there, so <laughs> they would have the cork dork hat, and like that would catch on. They'd post it. People would be like, "Who are the cork dorks? What's going on?" Or the flying <laughs> chunklas, or um, there's all sorts of different minor league names, all sorts of different hats, and they're all yeah, they're all definitely very very unique. Well, and I think that's cool too when the baseball hats take on like a different cultural meaning. Um, I mean, people say like Easy E and Ice Cube wearing the White Sox hat in Los Angeles. I think what is the Jay Z lyric made a Yankee hat more famous than a Yankee can, which I not a very <laughs> baseball friendly take. I didn't mean to bring that to the show. Goodness, <laughs> no, that's kind of derogatory. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say. It. But point being, you see these types of things in pop culture, and you realize how baseball hats can take off. But something that just drives me up a wall is if you see a big league hat in different colors than the one the way that it's intended like if you see a red yankees hat you're just like that's no oh, man yeah yeah well and also like i tend to only gravitate toward hats that are real right like yeah you can go to a lids and, and like and let's say you go into a lids in new york well they're gonna have a whole wall of very designer variations of yankees hats but could you find a Yankees minor league hat that they wore on a specific day? It's kind of like if you like to collect hats, which I know both of us do, then you're going <laughs> to find, you're going to look for stuff like that versus more of like designer, like, hey, we made it green. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a cool point. Yeah. <laughs> I actually do want that out of like when you realize that something's real of like me growing up in Colorado, one of my better friends growing up lived in Colorado Springs and I have a Colorado Springs sky socks hat of like, that's a pretty, I remember I was on a show with like me when I used to write for the Rockies and I showed up for just like some show, just, I was like on a panel and I'm wearing my sky socks hat. They introduced me as saying, yeah, instant credibility because he's wearing a minor league now defunct affiliate so I think to myself, like, I didn't even plan this, which is, yeah, I like the hat, but I'm talking about the Rockies yeah. wearing a former affiliate hat. I was feeling pretty good about that one. But, See, and that's no, smart. I agree. <laughs> it was unintended. It was one of my favorite. I wish I, like, did that on purpose, but that was one of my finer things that I never, that I, I didn't mean to do it, but it worked out in my favor, so that's good times. I want to shine light um, on one I, of my favorite baseball logos. Yeah. And it I is, was just going to ask. I, I don't want to hog the spotlight. I want you to show it off here. But 
I don't, I want it, and it's, it's not the hat so much as it is the logo, because a lot of their, what other sports, major sport, names their team after colored socks? Baseball, you have the yeah. white socks, you have the red socks, right? Well, you get aqua socks. Now you, you have, have that. After states of matter. Really. Aqua socks, and the logo is a pair of <laughs> socks that belong to a frog. <laughs> That's pretty baseball. Dude, you never know what you're going to run into. That's so pure. That's just so genuine, too. Man. And this was the BP hat. So if, so if you're... Yeah, on a minor league affiliate, you usually get three hats. It's a home hat, a away hat, and a BP hat. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's a like a Sunday hat, not often. And then you'll get one of these whenever that day comes around. Or you'll get, you know, one of these whenever that day comes around. But a lot of the times, your equipment that you get that's special edition is auctioned off to the fans after the oh, game. Oh, sure. So, like this one... For example, the one that I just had out, it has my my signature on the bottom of it because we we're all required to sign our hats after the game. But I told my my parents that while they were auctioning it off during the game, <laughs> you could do it, you could auction it, like they could bid online. And I said, "Hey, we got to get this hat because it's really cool. So can you bid on it for me during the game?" So they bid on it and won it. <laughs> But after the game, they came up to us and said, hey, sign your hat. We don't know who it's going to. And I didn't know if they won it or not. Oh, gee. Oh, so now you're just like. So now I'm signing my hat, but it ends up in my house when I get home after the off season because I didn't know that my parents had won the auction. And you're like, how do I explain this to the clubby that walked by here? I need you to sign your hat. Well, yeah, but maybe I want it and like my parents bought it. And- <laughs> I do that all the time. Every time we have a special edition um, hat and I'm like, that's cool. I want that. <laughs> I always text my parents like, bid on this for me. Bid on this hat for me. <laughs> really want it. Yeah, that reminds me. I was part of one of those when I was playing summer ball. We did a 4th of July jersey giveaway, and they auctioned. They opened the auction two weeks before the game. Max bids were 300 bucks. The day it opened, my jersey was the only one bought, and it was for 300 And it had, like, Justin Wick game-used jersey on it. Like, that was the leading thing. And mine was the only one, like, immediately somebody bid Max on it. I was thrilled. Came to find out it was one of the sponsored partners, which it had this dude's face on the outfield wall, and he wore 11 when he was in high school. But for a good week and a half, I was convinced I was the coolest guy. In <laughs> and then I was so deflated when I found out. I was like, damn it. Well, a lot, oh, of, the, no. a lot of the stuff, too, that I think is really cool, like here in the room, it's like you guys can't see, but I have a couple of the special edition jerseys that I really liked that I had my family bid on for me to be able to take home and it's funny because you get to the end of the game and you have the jersey and you're supposed to take a picture with the person who bid on the jersey and won your jersey oh, but i'm talking to the guy and he's like i can't find a jc johnson it's like i can't find the jc johnson that Bid. You're pulling up a photo of you on your jersey. Like, yeah, here she is. Right? <laughs> here she is. I'm taking this home. It's cool. Baseball memorabilia. <laughs> that's so pure. I mean, that's the best too, though. That's not me talking about the support system. That's some good stuff, man. Um, it, I I don't want to like steam over your hats here. Is there any other ones that you want to share? Oh man, I just got a lot of West Virginia Power ones. Um, there's one that I wear every day that I really like. It's all camo. Um, well, yeah, over the break, you said there was one that you wanted to show, though. Oh, yeah, but it's a uh, it's upstairs. It's the one that I usually wear for <laughs> for throwing. Um, oh, the camel. Oh, okay, all right, okay. it's all yeah, yeah it's all camel. Okay. There's only so many of those hats that actually still fit me. <laughs> because most of those I acquired while I had short hair. Um, well, let's see. I I did want to show one that had a lot of sentimental value to me. And I guess I'll talk about that now. As a, Yeah, I, I think this was the one that I was the 
this is the one I wanted to share. Yeah, yeah, that, that one. There you go. There's not a lot of these left because the person who started this uh, baseball field is now passed away. His name is Jerry Patterson, and this stands for uh, Patterson Field. It's in Fort Dodge, oh, Iowa. Awesome. Uh, it's over by the gypsum mines. Uh, there was a summer team that played there you know, for a few years. I don't know if they're still doing it. They're called the gypsum miners. Actually made their logo. Um, I remember that, yeah. But Jerry had a big passion for baseball. And he bought this plot of land kind of like slightly outside of Fort Dodge, not really. And he ended up building a baseball field with just him. He built the whole thing. It was like the exact same thing of Field of Dreams, but real life. And he built the whole thing. And my grandpa was good friends with Jerry. And um, my grandpa built a lot of the grandstands and the... Uh, concessions oh man and they have cool they have a and he built a little underground like cinder block area that's locked up that has all of jerry's baseball memorabilia in it because he was a lot like you uh wiki had a big passion for baseball and he collected a lot of stuff and in that area they call it the bat cave it was named by my cousin you go in there's all these old bats from all these famous players and nobody would know it's in there it's oh, so man. tucked away cool. back in there but um my grandpa has worked out there for a long time and i he would always take me out there when i was a kid me and my cousins and my brother and yeah. we would just play around and we'd help him drag the field and make the field and it, it felt like ours and if you go out yeah. there it's everything is made of wood and it's all hand painted and you have oh that's the best different signs <laughs> that say like they'll have the distance marker on like left field or right field or center field but then under it they'll have a name like in center field it's like 410 and then underneath it it says colossal clout and then on like left field it says you know, 315 and then underneath it has a different name for what another famous announcer would have called a home run. It's like That's very, so cool. very, very, everything is, oh gosh, it's hard to describe, but it's all painted and done as if you're at a tribute to historical baseball. And my grandpa has worked there for yeah. a long time. And when Jerry passed, um, my first car was Jerry's car. And oh, man. Jerry had given his car to my grandpa, who had given it to me. And inside his car, it was exactly how he left it. And all these old cassettes had all these old uh, baseball PA box, like baseball songs in cassettes. Jeez. So I still carry a lot of that stuff in my same car. And this was his hat for Patterson Field. And... That's the coolest thing, man. That's where I grew up, and that's where my grandpa still goes out there and works on stuff, even after Jerry's gone. <laughs> and this hat means a lot to me. It means a lot to, you know, my family. And I just, I love my grandpa. I love all the experiences I had out there. And yeah, it was. It's just this is really important. I don't. I don't. You know, I don't really take this out a lot because I just. I need to keep yeah. it good. Yeah, no, that's cool too. And I mean, especially too of, I think this is part, I mean, I'm not trying to expand this to hats in general, but I mean, speaking of one like that specifically of when you have something that tells such like a well articulated and such a pivotal like moment and story in your life is you can look back on that and you have a constant physical reminder of, you know, what it made you feel and how it made you come to life. And I mean, the relics, the history, the details of you go into the bat cave and you can you can see these stories like i mean i think that's part of the really cool thing of you know some people that like to collect the memorabilia i think it's even beyond just the collection of having the physical thing itself but it's recognizing that it's so much bigger than that and it tells a story that makes people feel and you know speaking of 
I think that people understand baseball fields next to cornfields in Iowa means something pretty special, of course. But when you recognize that, you know, this level of understanding and this level of having that reminder of realizing that it keeps you grounded, it keeps you aware of, you know, the really good things that this game brings into our lives. You know, that's something that, I mean, I look at, sometimes I kind of scoff at the fact that I have so many hats, but I know that every single one of them tells the story of a point in time where I was and something that, you know, not only helped shape me for who I was moving forward, but it, it helps illustrate a moment that I just had a really good time celebrating the game. So, you know, that's really cool, especially when you have one like that that just paints a picture that you look over and you're like, yeah, this is what I do it for. Like, this is why I do what I do. This is why I love this game. You know, that's that's the quality of, you know, there's a little bit more than just the physical thing that you put on your head when you start mixing some stories like that in there. And that's one of the coolest parts of this game. Yeah, I agree. And I just want to say, as we get to the end of this episode, I'm going to go ahead and require that Wick just put pictures of Patterson Field like right here. <laughs> just because I want, it, do, I want it to have a ton of credit. My grandma works at concession stand. I've been working it forever. It's just, it needs to go right here. And <laughs> if at any point somebody says that field should not be there anymore, I will throw away my whatever I have to keep it there because that's the best. That's inspiration. <laughs> That's what it's all about, man. You know, I think that's amazing to see that. I mean, the passion and the enthusiasm that people have for things that, you know, I encourage everybody to find what it is that they cling on to like that, because that's what makes you realize that we're human, that these things matter, that these things are just the incredible sides of who it is that we are and what we like to celebrate. And that's I mean, if you're if you're tuning into these episodes, you enjoy celebrating the game of baseball. And that means we need to put the spotlight on a baseball field that deserves a ton of credit, man. I mean, this is what it's about, and this is the proof that Jerry lives on, man. There you go. That's what That's it's all right. about. <laughs> you know, I, I cannot show anything of mine that would supersede anything like that. I think that takes the cake on the most <laughs> sentimental one that's there. I mean, that's that's some special details, but... You know, it's cool to recognize that those people are still with us. Those people, were carrying those stories with us, and we're going to continue to grow progress i think that ties in very well to the first half of the episode that we had talking about you know growing the game and leaving your mark making the impact and recognizing that you know that impact doesn't go away that impact is always there and you're continuing to push the entire the game forward the people that are important to you the people that make this such a lasting detail you're going to continue to elevate and update those details but at the same time it's really cool when you're able to honor those details as they present and realize that you're in a extension of the next generation carrying the torch bringing light to those good things in the world that's why we do what we do man that's part of the reason that i don't ever really want to apologize for having this many hats because they all some degree of story and i feel pretty good about each of them but you know those are the stories to feel absolutely the best about and you know i'm happy thank you for sharing that right there man i admit i hadn't heard those full details before and like i kind of feel bad that it took our show for me to find out all of the but I am like overjoyed to have heard all of that. Context. I hope he's still rattling off pictures of that place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring him back. There you go. We'll make it work, man. There we have it, man. Evan, I'll turn it to you. You got any final thoughts for us? Nope. That's it. Enjoy the game of baseball. Enjoy what it's there for. Enjoy the tradition. Be yourself. And gosh dang it, just have fun. And show some love to the color cream, too. You know what? I want to try to act like I'm getting on your level. That's a great hat. That's Actually, a great hat. Yeah, I'm going to feel I'm gonna feel corny if I wear this. Clothes. That's going to sound like the most forced thing ever. Speaking of Iowa, yeah, here's another Iowa hat for you. A little feel the dreams business. I just wanted to show some love to the color cream right there. Um, we're going to try to get cream night pitch hats. I, I didn't know if I wanted to share this on the show, but I know this is something that's hopefully in the works. And I think now we have to do it. So if all goes to plan, that's going to be the latest inquiry. And you never know. Maybe there'll be a giveaway in the horizon. Maybe there'll be some shout outs for the people that are staying diligent, tuning into each of these episodes, having a great time. We're going to continue carrying the torch for the color cream because that's our logo. That's what we do. And that's what we love celebrating about the game of baseball is a very distinct baseball color. What you got? You got a little nugget for us? Yes. If you're here and you've been staying diligent, watch the episodes, leave a comment so we know. 
and we'll send you some drip <laughs> once we get it. That's right. There you go. We'll represent. We'll keep carrying the torch right there, man. That's the incentive for staying true to the end of the episode right there, man. As always, much appreciated for all of your diligence following along with these episodes. And as long as you guys keep enjoying them, we're going to keep pumping them out because we're having an absolute blast doing so. Make sure you check us out on all the social channels. Check out all the cool business. We're a lot more active now. Got a lot of different details coming through. Not just videos either, but we'll keep having fun with it. We'll keep supporting you guys. And we, as always, appreciate the support that you bring to us. Until next time, he's Evan Johnson. I'm Justin Wick. This is The Night Pitch. We will see you next time. Eric Hansen's This Is Iowa takes us to another championship at another ball diamond across town where the quirks and commitment have produced just as many lifelong memories. Three bases and a home plate is all you really need. But in Fort Dodge, you'll find an always free show just past the curve in the road where Baseball Avenue meets National Pastime Road. It's a great day at the ballpark. If the sun's out, the neighborhood kids will be too, just like they have been for 46 summers. It's just kind of a known thing around town. I mean, if you're bored and you want to come out and watch some baseball, it's out here. And one glimpse of the polka dot monster will tell you Patterson Fields, not just another diamond. I think it's a special place. Isaac Quintana. At a time most teenage parks don't bother with a PA. Drug! Here, it's part of the show. Hey, let's take a look at those lucky number tickets again. Where free raffles every half inning get fans out of the homemade grandstands and past the eye chart on the umpire's room to claim their ticket for a taco or spaghetti dinner. There's evidence it's been like this for decades in the Bat Cave. Where wood and metal memories hang. Ozzy Ozzy Smith played on this field one time. But you won't find the real star of this show, who gave today's coach. This was his baby. The PA announcer. He loved baseball. He loved kids. Even the umpire. Absolutely wonderful man. Their love of this game. In 1966, Jerry Patterson bought nine acres of junk land near Fort Dodge's gypsum mines. He started it, you know, just as a plain, simple little ballpark with some fences, you know. And he was out here morning, noon, and night, you know, until it got dark. He created it from the ground up. With one goal. Do I have any chicken dancers out there? To give every kid a baseball memory. Even if you're more excited about the free snow cone you get for dancing. Uh, I'll have a green. Than the outcome of the game. It was sort of a family night entertainment not just baseball but he included the whole family in it even two summers ago when the stomach cancer started progressing he would never let you know he'd always say he's okay it's baseball's in your blood it's forever you know richie two out when jerry patterson died a year and a half ago his friends made a promise his baby would live on as you can hear the innocence is still here in the music and the you know the refreshments and everything because there's no doubt Jerry created a beautiful setting. People will come out here just in the car when I'm working in the morning and just sit for a little while. You know, and look at the ballpark. And even more important, the colossal memories he's still planting. I mean, it's, it's, it's Patterson Field. I mean, it's, it's tough to explain, but that's what it is. In Fort Dodge, Eric Hansen, KCCI 8 News, Iowa's news leader. Jerry's family still owns the Fort Dodge property where his diamond stands, but his rules still apply. Kids never pay a penny to play. Admission is always free, and as long as there's baseball, it'll be a fun experience.